Before we go any further, please hit that subscribe and or follow button in front of you. It's a key performance indicator for the podcast and we really appreciate it. You know, this wasn't our first trip to Ukraine. Because obviously the, the war happened, changed our priorities. The decision was made. Everything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong. Since 2007, the Scottish Emergency Rescue Association has delivered over 71 fully equipped fire engines and ambulances to countries such as Moldova, Ukraine, Serbia, Romania and Burundi. In addition to the donation of equipment, Sarah has trained hundreds of local firefighters in each of the host countries in order so that they can safely use and maintain the equipment and vehicles provided while serving their communities. Now, I know we will all be aware of the incredible challenges being faced by the people of Ukraine, and Sarah started planning to respond and support our fire service colleagues in Ukraine in December 2021. Sarah has recently donated fire engines and equipment to Ukraine, and today we're hearing from Mike, who's one of the firefighters that has taken part in training and facilitating these trips in the past and was part of the most recent transport operation delivering this life-saving equipment to the people of Ukraine. Problem now we had is that the trucks are being left in Ukraine and we need to walk back into Hungary. This suddenly is a problem. I don't think we appreciate that. You know, that passport lets me leave the country that is at war and other people are not allowed to do that just purely because the accident of birth came to this world a different bit of land. The Firefighters Podcast is a global podcast seeking to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operators. We have wide-ranging conversations celebrating those within our emergency services family and encouraging the support of this incredible group of people. It's hosted by myself, Operational UK Firefighter Pete Wakefield. Please support your emergency services wherever you are in the world, and thank you for listening. How are you doing, brother? I'm good. I'm good. How is things with you? I am bloody fantastic, my man. Kicking ass, taking names. Glad to hear you are safe. Glad to hear you back. Ah, uh, you know, it was nothing. It was nothing. <laughs> the, the, the typical response of a firefighter. Yeah, it was nothing, man. You know, it was just just one of them things we do. That's just what we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's just part of the job. Mate, I think, I imagine, and I don't know, I know it's something we're going to get into today, It's good. it was very much kind of probably hurry up and wait in many instances, and uh, I know a lot of time in the emergency services for a lot of people don't realise there's a lot of standing around, and then it's go, and then it's stop, and then it's wait for permission, and then it's go. Definitely was, definitely was, and and to be fair, it was one of the, probably one of the more challenging trips, because everything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong, so, but again, you know, we've, we've, we've come to the other side, and it, it, now it's, it's just the joy of, of actually being done successful. And yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with how it went. A quick update from one of our partners and we'll be right back to the show. Today's episode was brought to you by our partner, Williamwood Watches. Now in support of the firefighters charity, Williamwood Watches, who are the makers of those beautiful luxury watches from upcycled firefighting equipment, are bringing you the always ready motorcycle. It's super essential to make you aware of this one, folks, because there are only 300 tickets available. Williamwood Watches have partnered with a talented Sultan Motorcycles, and they're bringing you the first Williamwood Watches motorcycle. This is incorporating the workings of all of their watches and adorned with multiple elements of upcycled firefighting materials. This is a one-off motorcycle, and it's like nothing you've ever seen before. It can only be won if you're in the prize draw. You can enter the prize draw if you follow the link in the post below this episode. All profits raised from the sale of the Always Ready Motorbike will be donated to the firefighters charity in the UK, supporting firefighters and their families not only does making a purchase from William Will Watches mean you will get your hands on one of those beautiful and authentic luxury pieces of firefighting nostalgia but you will be supporting this effort and giving a donation to the people that operate in our sector now back to the show I was blown away that I suppose I wasn't I wasn't I was totally surprised when I it's one of them serendipitous things I'll get my words out in a minute finding out Mm -hmm. that you were a part of this was surreal but in a strange way not entirely surprising so I mean, you and i have been <laughs> conversing for quite some time and you are i'm gonna say you're one of the rare individuals and i'm gonna say that kind of like me that is uh that is so sincerely deeply dedicated to trying to see the best of the people that are in the emergency services and raise those standards and you know do what you morally think is right and uh, we've had lots of conversations over probably the past sort of two years you've given loads of sort of support mm-hmm. and guidance and little nudges here and there and stuff with the podcast you've introduced us to some incredible guests some of the best guests we've ever had and i know you've supported us with a massive list of people but that is not what we're uh, what we're here talking about today um you've just uh, you've just come back from 
I mean, I mean, I'll let you go through. You've just come back from a pretty surreal experience, I imagine. Yes, although I think for us it's a bit different because you know this wasn't our first trip to Ukraine. We didn't react to the war as in many people did by going into the unknown. Because we were there before, we knew people there. We've trained the firefighters there. You know, I did personally. So we 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 had contact and. And for us, it was a lot more than just deliver another uh, uh, truckload of, of, of equipment or fire engines. Mm-hmm. You know, it was actually to go through and help our friends. Which is quite a surreal thing for a lot yeah. of people because we have seen uh, in the best of intentions and all that sort of stuff, we've seen a lot of knee-jerk reaction, which is great, you know, and we want people, you know, yeah, when, when there's a massive call to arms as such, we want people to, to, to reach down within themselves, whether that's personally, financially, with their skill sets, with their resources, vehicles, connections, whatever it may be. And that's kind of what we're doing here today, really, you know, is to support the effort like this. But but take us back, mm-hmm. because like you've just said, this, this wasn't completely unknown territory for you. You've been doing a lot of work with the Scottish Emergency Rescue Association for, for quite some time now. And how has this relationship with places like Ukraine, which is only one of, of, of sort of many areas that the organization supports, when did that first come about? Because you've been doing this sort of stuff for a little while now, or certainly the organization has. Yes. Uh, so just very, very quickly. So Sarah, the Scottish Emergency Rescue Association, has started in 2007 uh, with a trip to Serbia, if I remember correctly. And since then, has been supporting emergency services in the countries maybe less fortunate than ourselves. I have started with them about 2000, maybe 18 or 17. I went to Moldova first. Uh, We took, I think, five or six fire engines and then stayed there for a week worth of training. And then it progressed on to other trips. And in 2019, we went to Ukraine. And that was for the first time, because like Moldova trips, we were going there every year for the last 15 years. But 2019 trip to Ukraine was the first one of its kind. We'd never been to Ukraine before. Uh, so it was a bit of an unknown. And at the time, we've delivered three fire engines and training. Uh, there were some guys from UKRO there delivering extrication training as well at the same time. Uh, so we cooperated with them. I think that's Steve. Uh, you know, that's that's Steve and, and the work that he'd done. So Steve North. You know how like when you mm-hmm. when you get I've you know we've gone halfway around the world in something after that's a bit of an exaggeration. We've travelled to places a long <laughs> way off, and it's so strange when you get there and then you realise there's a very close connection with somebody that's already within your sort of social circle. So you mentioned, um, you know, Serbia. I've literally, yeah. you know, I mean, beginning of the year, because I know we spoke after we put the podcast out, that we're mm-hmm. over there speaking with John Dune, speaking about the work United Nations have done, and they referred, literally referred to Sarah, to people like Fire, to the United Nations, about the very work that will have been, not necessarily yourself, but will have been you and, and, and you know, other individuals yeah. in those organisations. And you can travel all that way and somebody goes, oh, well, you probably don't know about it, but we got so-and-so was over here in 2007. And I'm like, I know that dude. I literally yeah. know that. I know those people. <laughs> and you're like, it, it shouldn't be surprising because, you know, I mean, Steve Jobs always says connect, connecting the dots, looking backwards. And when you look and you're like, ah, these sort of people are going to place themselves in those situations. Not because those situations present themselves, because of the type of person that they are. And it seems like things like Sarah and stuff like that and, and Ucro attracts those kinds of diehard, passionate, do do the right thing kind of people. And you see them crop up everywhere then. Definitely. And, 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 and what the funny thing is that on all of those trips, every new chance to uh, network with another organization you get, you meet new people and they're, they're always great, great people. But at the same time, after a few years, you start noticing that you, you, you see or hear the same names being mentioned. You know, and, and, and I think in general, that circle of, as you say, quite enthusiastic people or, or freaks, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite small. You know, once you, once you get into it and you start uh, meeting people, talking with people, and you know that more than anybody else doing the podcast, that then you, you kind of entered the, in the circle. And it's great within it. Do you know what the irony is, though? There's no... Wow, well, okay, I, mean, I was going to say there's no cost to get in that circle. And there isn't a cost. Mm-hmm. It's 
be a good no, person, no. be bas- be passionate about what you do for a living, do the right thing. And that 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 sometimes that's not that's not a rare thing because there's a lot of wonderful people out there. But it's that combination of being audacious enough to put your hand up and go, I think that's the right yep. thing to do. I, I, I want to get involved in that. I don't know how to do it. I don't know what it is. I've got some skill sets that I can offer. And you'd be surprised the amount of people that go, yes, 100%, come here, go there. Uh, if you can jump on this train Definitely. or if you can get on that flight. So that's the irony of it. People think that like, oh, well, is this, this is like a special handshake group or you've got to pay a membership <laughs> to me. It's, not, it's nothing like that. It's just be a good person. And, you know, if you think some, that something's the right thing to do, raise your hand, put your head above the parapet. Because the amount of people, and, I, and I'd be interested to hear from you, you know, do you ever have those people that are like, oh, yeah, you're going off on this uh, other thing again, Mike. You know, you're, uh, you're off on a bit of a gallivanting. You're off mm-hmm. on your little crazy trip. You're off on your stamping your feet, totally. raising your arms in the air. And you're like, dude, <sighs> and that, I, I, I don't rise to it now as much as I used to. But that is, ugh, God, man, I hate that. You must get that sometimes. It's, it's 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 more the case of uh, the trips sometimes are seen by the people from out with this uh, this sector or, or out with not involved in in charity like that as as some kind of jolly you know yeah. that will 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 go across for a week's holiday basically and to be fair with you because I love my job you know and 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 I like uh, spending time with other firefighters whether I'm teaching them or they teaching me, it doesn't really matter because we're all learning something. Uh, and I know that's true for you because what they don't see, like they, they might see the jolly and then point the finger at the jolly. They don't see the hours and hours you spend on, on the phone to people from all over the world just trying to you know make yourself a more well-rounded consumer professional. They don't see you paying your own money to go to the high-rise seminars and the high, you know all of those small things that are done in the darkness and then all of a sudden you're yes. asked to bring your skill sets to an opportunity like this. It's, it's all the unknowns. I, you know, it's like, you know, Muhammad Ali says, you know, it's one in the gym. And, you know, I always talk about grinding in the darkness to serve the light and all that sort of stuff. And that's where most of it is. You know, it's that torturous and, and, hours where you're constantly trying to seek the answers and connect with the people. No, nobody sees that bit. Totally, totally. And especially, you know, with every one of those trips, the preparation for it will start months in advance. Uh, for example, uh, for this Ukraine trip, because obviously the, the war happened, changed our priorities, we weren't meant to go to Ukraine this year at all. We were planning to go to Moldova in May. So the, 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 the cogs were uh, turning yeah. and, and, and wheels were in motion for that trip. And we were collecting equipment, you know, sourcing fire engines, packing it all up. And basically, when the when the when the war broke out, the decision was made. Why don't we? Uh, we got another three fire engines from Scottish Fire Rescue Service, and we then added one from the stock that we had for Moldova. And basically, we made the we made the the trip within two weeks, and that was two weeks of 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 somebody, not necessarily myself, every day, but throughout the two weeks, every day, somebody was down at the at the unit that we've got grafting you know yeah. putting testing the ba sets testing the equipment mm. fixing the trucks whatever whatever needs done and and there is hundreds of things to be done before mm. a trip like that but unfortunately people not involved in it only see the the glory bit at the end you yeah, know yeah, that's yeah. in the newspaper in the newspaper or in the on tv that we are leaving for for ukraine Mm. Uh, but that this, well, like this you say, is when you say oh who wants to come down and size all the fire kit and write it all down on a piece of paper <laughs> who wants to you know make sure all the cylinders are empty because we can't transport or whatever you know whatever the regulation might be nobody sees it. I always see this with the ISAR team because um, we have logistics teams and stuff like that and every time we go on and, and even just a training deployment in the UK the base of operations they get out like 50 tents it must be more than that mm-hmm. it takes us like two hours to put them up and then every time they use, every time they go back, you know, there's a group of like five or six individuals that have to get them all out again and have to dry them all yeah. up. They have to put yeah. them all up in basically like a warehouse. And that is just, that work is just dull as balls. You know, if you are not sincerely yeah. interested yeah. in what it takes to put something like this together, you know, the amount of people who raise their hand, I'm sure for, for stuff like Sarah, like this, and go, oh yeah, I, could, I can go out on the 11th, I'm available for the flight. And you're like, good, because it starts on the 5th and we're going to do six days 
of sorting through stuff, of checking the tire pressures, of, you know, I know you had issues with the DVLA and all that's all of those small things that are, are yeah, essential totally. footsteps to get you on the start line, not even, you know, on mm-hmm. the journey, just to get to the start line. There's a whole journey in itself. Definitely, you're totally right. And, 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 and as you say, it does take months of planning. And then when it comes to the trip, and especially in, in this case, because the Ukraine was obviously quite, uh, you know, everybody everybody was aware of it. Yeah. And once, once everybody wanted to, to say, oh, I can help, I can drive, you know, if possible. Can, can I go as well? Can I go as well? But then to say to people, oh, if you want to help, just come down and, and yeah, sort, sort PPE. Uh, oh, and, yeah. and then and then suddenly it's like, uh, oh, I've got you know, I'm washing my hair that day. <laughs> there's uh, a very there's a very uh, strange thing people don't realise. There's a lot of disaster tourists, you know, and I, and I've heard them. I'm not going to throw stones or anything. Like that. I'm not going to make any names, but been, obviously I listen to a lot of podcasts and all that sort of stuff. And you hear people saying, I felt the urge to go over to Ukraine because I needed to witness it. And I and I keep listening, yeah. I keep, and I'm like, so what? What? What was the value you added while she were there, or were you just there taking pictures, getting freaking selfies, you know? And yeah, and I'm like, what? what you, your, was your business or your organization or your skill set? You know, okay, you know, you hear about doctors and vets and school teachers turning up, and that's great, you know. But then when you just hear somebody go, I just needed to see it for myself, right? Well, we can't have a goddamn audience because there there is yeah. there's enough yeah. disaster freaking you know tourists that just slow stuff down. and they become part of the problem because when you're there like yourselves as an emergency services organization or you're part of a united nations organization or just in country organization you are now somebody that needs to be facilitated for you are in the count totally. you are like there's 500 members of the, of the public here you know there's five citizens here you, you're one of them you're, you're part of the problem now because you might become a victim you might become a casualty you might you might just get stuck there and they go, we've got 20 UK nationals stuck in Ukraine. They freaking went there themselves. They bloody, they pushed themselves across the border with yeah. no ability to, to add any value. They just went, you guys were a, were a fantastic inject. You were like in out, add value, give the resources and, you know, and then, and then, and then give them the support they need. I wanted to double click for a second because I don't want us to brush over it on the fact that when you said, you know, all this stuff was, was prepped for Moldova originally that must have been mm-hmm. a really, really, and I know it wasn't, you're obviously part of the organization, but the decision from whoever had to make it to say, we're going to pull it off there to, to, to go to send it here. And this, but it's such a nice analogy as well for the emergency services because people always forget, you know, when you're one place, you're not another. And as obvious as that sounds, when we go to fire calls or emergency services or, you know, paramedics are stuck with somebody they're there and it means they can't be somewhere else helping somebody else. And this is like a wonderful closed loop example of where you, has someone had to make that difficult decision because the people of Moldova you mm-hmm. know, still, still need that support. They still have their challenges as well. And I know you say you're, you know, you've sourced another three and I know that this cycle continues to go, but that's got to be a difficult decision to make. Definitely, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'm not pretending to be in any way responsible for that because obviously uh, – Gary Bennett, who's in charge of Sarah, he he does amazing, amazing work. Great guy, uh, guy. But at the same time, I think because we've got quite a working sh- uh, working relationship with Moldovan Fire Service, as I said, we've we've been there for years now. We have actually reached the stage where, for example, the whole of Moldova is using MSABA sets that we have supplied. That's crazy. Uh, that is so crazy. Uh, you know, so basically. We as Sarah supplied the whole country of BA set, so they've got the uniformed approach to it. How has that become a need? And I'm not talking MSA, I'm not talking Vakit, but like we are, we have this elitist thing. And then again, perspective is such a beautiful thing because you only know, you see unknown unknowns, you only see what's as part of your world. And when you go there and you see the level of equipment that they have and don't have, and or you know, organizations and, or, and governments and stuff like ours are giving that aid. What what was it like the first time you guys went to Moldova and saw the the state or the lack of equipment? What what was a normal fire engine look like over there before organizations like Sarah get involved? Oh, majority of them in those countries that used to be maybe communist countries or are, are under Soviet influence. A lot of their equipment is still post Soviet kind of eighties, you know, big big trucks. Yeah, like it, it, it actually quite similar to the trucks that now you see in Ukrainian war for Russian army army uses, uh, or you maybe have seen them in uh, Chernobyl 
uh, series on 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 whatever it was on Netflix or yes, Amazon. Netflix. I think it was Netflix. Uh, yeah. So so these basically, uh, especially when we went to Ukraine the first time, those were exact vehicles that they still have, uh, and 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 the equipment is it, it varies greatly because the guys in the maybe capital city will have the stuff that that puts us into shame, but then you go outside of that and and it's really really poor you know with few lengths of hose and a pump pump and that's that's all they've got that's a surreal thought so 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 run us through what actually went where did you go how did you get there and what did you actually take because it kept growing and growing you know you had some wonderful donations and and was it right so to ukraine for this trip we'll concentrate on this trip because obviously this is the the, the, the most recent one. Yeah. Uh, we took four fire engines and one 18 ton lorry of equipment. The, the, the lorry, we have bought that lorry as a, as a charity a couple of years ago mm. or maybe three years ago. So now we just use, because we always had more equipment than fire engines. Yeah. And, and we couldn't possibly send all the equipment we wanted just by packing the lockers. Now nah, people forget that the lockers, um, don't really fit as much as you think they do. They're designed for quick access. They're not designed for piling as much in there as possible. There's a lot of shelves no. and stuff that kind of get in the way, in all honesty, when you're trying to move it. This is the 18-ton, like, rigid. There'll be, I mean, we'll use some photos of it for the stuff people see on the socials, but it's a rigid um, box 18-ton lorry. Box lorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and obviously with the fire engine, the problem is that when you're on the trip like that, you're carrying... 1800 liters of fresh air in the middle between those lockers, which you can't <laughs> fill with anything. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so basically, the, the idea was to buy a box lorry and then we can transport, especially PPE, uh, and then bring the lorry back. Uh, so that's what we've done for the last couple of years. And, uh, and, and I'll, I'll maybe mention later about the relay that the lorry did on its own. That was, that was some uh, feat uh, that we've done a couple of years ago. But let's go back to Ukraine. Uh, so four fire engines and the box lorry full of equipment and the the box and I mean full of equipment the box the, the lorry was packed to the ceiling you know with the he- heavy stuff like cutting equipment the ballistic equipment on the bottom pumps yeah uh, I saw the pumps just like uh, there's a two or three of them sticking not sticking out the back but they were like some of the last yeah. things to go on because again you've got to think of all the little you know the weight balance and the placement of everything because some of this kit is heavy oh definitely we had to load up and then we we've got a friendly way bridge quite close to our uh, yard so we were just going in and out all the time and the uh, people there are very very nice to us uh, allow us to weigh it for free so so obviously we were making sure at all times that we are above the law as well yeah uh, but but the, but the lorry eventually ended up packed to the to the roof with with the PPE you know with the fire gear uh, it was it was unbelievable that's like a weird game of uh, so, Jenga in itself, isn't it? It's, it totally is. It totally is. Uh, and it was, to be fair, when we were unpacking it in, in Ukraine, it was, uh, we, could, we couldn't pull it out. It was so well packed <laughs> that we couldn't pull the fire gear out. But anyway, so the unfortunate events started very early on because we left uh, the UK, or we left Edinburgh on the day that the p fiasco happened. Because oh, we've we've been having some comms through this, and you were sending me photos, and like you you were just stuck. It was like you know you couldn't do, you know, game over before you'd even left the UK. But uh, the eternal problem solvers that I know the emergency services are, but that was just just really bad timing. It, it, it was it was quite a downer, you know, for everybody because it's because we 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 were supposed to go to Hull and take a ferry down to Rotterdam, I think, and and that was obviously a P and O ferry. Uh, so, so that was out of the question, and because of the uh, P and O problems, all the other ferries like the FDS were overrun yeah. uh, by by freight and lorries. Uh, so, so it was it was we we looked for alternatives maybe from Newcastle to Amsterdam, but that was booked solid for another three four days. Uh, so, 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 uh, so eventually it's got to be bloody got, cr- ridiculously uh, expensive as well. I'm at, in, in those types of times where you're effectively, you know, you're, you're competing against organisations and businesses, and you know, f- to get these spots to get a vehicle like that on there. And at the, at the end of the day, it's a charity. You know, you're, you're doing this for yeah. international aid, but and this is no damning on any of the ferry companies or anybody else. 
but nobody cares. Not nobody cares, but it's like, dude, it's a place on a ferry and they're trying to run a business. So it's going to get expensive quite quickly, I'd imagine. That's it. That's it. And uh, it's quite a funny thing is that for 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 last couple of years, we actually had a deal with P&O ferries that where we had half price uh, ferry crossing. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that that's got to come straight out of the budget, like you're saying. It's got to be so frustrating, but it's part of the whole um, cogs of the vehicle that, that needs to get it there. Just a quick reminder of our monthly giveaway with our partner Hikes and Tallyman. If you jump over to our social media platforms, you can once again get a chance to win a pair of Hikes Black Eagle Adventure GTX boots. Hikes is one of the biggest and best brands in the boot market and now supplies armies around the world, equipping special units, firefighters, paramedics, police officers when it comes to high quality, high tech footwear. And from our partner Tallyman, you can get two personalized BA tallies with your name on them and the logo of the podcast on the back. Just head over to our social media channels and all the instructions are there you got to scroll through find the post and get on it now back to the show definitely so first day of our driving we got as far as i think derby and then we were basically stuck we didn't for the evening we just stopped and didn't know which way to go you know we even considered maybe going to plymouth and taking a ferry from there to france yeah which is obviously extending our route considerably but if that was the only option we would have done it it's progress isn't it? Uh, so definitely. So we stopped for the night, and we thought in the morning we'll we'll we were hoping that the P and O thing is going to just blow over. You know, mm-hmm. the the government maybe is going to step in, or P and O will will rethink their their strategy and 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 get back to work or whatever. But obviously, none of those things happened. Yeah. So then in the morning we just decided that we'll go to Dover, join the queue that was already considerable by that time, and just wait. And when we say considerable. This was like as far as the eye can see. You know, when you send me those oh, photos, this is, is lorries upon lorries upon lorries upon lorries. You could, there was no end in sight for this. I'd just be demoralized was, saying that. It, it was a good few miles. Plus the uh, fuel. But, Jesus, man, the fuel costs that have just been exploding lately, the people must, there's just so many factors there. Oh, it, believe me, Pete, when, when we were, because I was paying... Obviously, it's through the charity, but I was the, 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 the person responsible for paying for fuel in my fire engine because there was three people in each fire engine. Uh, I, I, I was paying about £2.40 a litre in oh, Germany. you fighter. Hey, we for we because so, we've been uh, on like reserve stocks. Uh, oh, sorry, we've been trying to mm-hmm. hold reserve stocks in our service. And I remember we went and filled up the other day. We're supposed to fill them up every time they get to three quarters, but we've been out for ages, so it was down to like a quarter. And I swear to God, it was like two hundred and something quid to fill it three quarters. And I was like, Jesus Christ, that is just unreal when you think about yeah. it. When you start turning the volume up on stuff like that, and we're not going to get into the political side of that, but it is just such. They've got you by the short and curly. Definitely, you, there's nothing you can do about it. And, 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 you know, and for us having five lorries going and now not only going maybe to Hull or to Newcastle, we have to go all the way to Dover. And then on the other side of the <laughs> channel, we're starting in France and not in Amsterdam. That's, that adds another, yeah, you know, few hundred pounds. Very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's, it, it, it seriously dents the money of the charity. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, we're, we're so far involved that we're not going to turn around. No, you've passed that point uh, of no return. It's it's going. It's just like just keep limping it there. Just keep going. Just get it there. Just get it there. Just get it over the line. So, so so when did you actually arrive, and and where did you arrive? Uh, so we've arrived. We had a, again a brilliant help from one of my friends who arranged us a night in uh, one of the fire stations just outside Budapest in Hungary. Wow. Uh, and we were supposed to have a night there, but because we had a few breakdowns and uh, and delays on the motorways in Germany, we arrived there at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so it wasn't much of a night because then we had to leave at seven in the morning the next day. <laughs> what broke? What, what broke down? What, what did we start struggling with? Uh, it's just trucks, you know, air leak uh, on one. Uh, then the, the the weight in the other was uh, the, in the box lorry was. Uh, a bit too high up and we had to rejig it. So a People lot of things had to come out. Only, these are donated vehicles. Not donated, some are purchased, but most are donated vehicles to an extent, yes. which means they are end of their life as per UK regulations and the way that the services like to keep their fleet maintained. So these 
these are not brand new vehicles. You know, somebody is nursing them um, through the process to even get them to a point where we feel comfortable to donate them to a country and, you know, be able to sort of put, put Sarah's name or put the you know, UK's name on it and go, this is a safe vehicle. Definitely. And, 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 you know, we can't forget that these are fire engines. They, they've made, even if the mileage on them is high, the, the mileage probably was very sharp, short journeys. Yeah, you know, people and forget, now, and, and, and they think about their own vehicle. They would usually like turn it on on the driveway, give it a couple of minutes. Firefighters, with the greatest of respect, we are knuckle dragging firefighters. <laughs> we jump on it, we gun the hell out of it, we get it somewhere, we rag the arse off it by cranking the, the you know the the uh, the shaft up, and then we operate at high pressure. Then we switch it off straight away and go back to bed. <laughs> definitely, definitely. The mechanical sympathy uh, that's done on that vehicle is not great, and they get they get dings uh, and scratches and all yeah. sorts. And suddenly, you know, after 20 year life of this vehicle like that, it's being asked to drive, you know, 2000 <laughs> miles yeah. in one go. Uh, so it's a big shock to the system. Yeah, it's a lorry, but it's not treated like any other lorry usually is. It's, it's like the no. worst, worst way to use a lorry is how we use them in the emergency <laughs> services, basically. <laughs> Yeah, professional drivers would be would be tearing their head out. <laughs> so, so, so when you managed to get firstly, like when you got to Budapest, like only like all great fight, you didn't get there till four a.m. What, what was the reception like? You know, obviously, you say you you met up with a friend there. They sort you out some food, or, or what? How long were you able to stay there and catch up before you had to move on? Oh, we we, we had maybe two three hours sleep there. <sighs> uh, I I couldn't sleep because everybody was snoring anyway, so I just went upstairs to talk. <laughs> talk with the guys that were in the station there, the, the Hungarians. Uh, they've made us breakfast and everything, so they were great. Uh, what's what's they, breakfast they, look like in Budapest? Uh, just sandwiches with a bit of ham and cucumber and tomato in them. And, and you know. And to be fair with you, Pete, after three days of living off crisps and chocolate <laughs> in the fire engine, <laughs> I'd have eaten anything. Anything, <laughs> and, and anything is a treat. Yeah, uh, yeah so, that's a fair point. So, so that was that was really nice. You know, they gave us a little tour of their uh, station and the, showed their fire engines. And that, one of them was brilliant, by the way. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it in the UK. But uh, anyway, so and then we set off. Again, we had a good, uh, I, I don't know how to call that guy, but let's say call him a fixer. We had a good fixer in Hungary. Yeah. And and he was the kind of guy that looked after us, uh, again, for, 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 for his, due to his charitable nature. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't charging us for it. So he led us through Budapest and then pointed us basically towards the border. People forget and, how essential and, a good fixer is, to be honest, because they can save you so oh, much money and so many mistakes and so many um, local, um, even just behavioral or cultural mishaps that you can very quickly cause offense or go in the wrong places or you know, all that sort of stuff. So they are a really crucial cog of this. He saved us from so many mistakes. Yeah. And then right at the very end where we thought we're, we're home and dry, we maybe dropped the ball a little bit and totally got in trouble and he <laughs> had to get us out of it. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to mention where we went for the border because the Ukrainian colleagues asked us not to of disclose course. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we did get to the border. There was a lot of weight. You know, you can imagine how uh, all the customs paper, despite you're going with, with, with charitable donations, yeah. the, the, the customs paperwork still needs to be in order. Yeah. So it, take, it was taking good five, six hours of sitting at the border and just twiddling our thumbs. Yeah. And like I say, when it comes to those disaster tourists, those sort of people clog those things up when, you know, people totally, are just trying to get totally. in and out for no reasons where there's people in either trying to provide genuine care or support or people just sincerely just trying to get out of there for, for their lives and their families and stuff like that. But but then, and then the interesting, interesting thing happened because initially the Ukrainians were supposed to come to us, to the Hungarian side of the border and pick up the trucks. Okay. Uh, then throughout the day, as we were driving to the border, they got in touch with us and said that the Hungarians will not let them in. So wow. we need to, if possible, for us to cross, to leave Hungary and, 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 and go into that kind of, you know, how old fashioned borders work, that the one country ends, then there is a little bit of no man's land and then yeah. another country begins. 
Why, so why was to that me, then? Oh, I mean, again, we don't want to we don't want to divulge anything that's not um, going to be in no, anybody's but, best okay, interest. I, I, but I, I, that, that must be what what was the thought process behind that? Why why were the barriers? Do you think? Oh, it's it's mainly the the, the problems these days are because the males eighteen to sixty can't leave Ukraine, right? Uh, due to the war, uh, so they are they are there for the war effort, and as much as this this was obviously officially arranged with the Ukrainian fire service, so the Ukrainian side would have let them out, but Hungarians, to, to, to save themselves any, any problems with that, wouldn't let them in. Yeah, because stuff can get uh, twisted and everything like that, and if they hear yeah, yeah, yeah. Six, six males were allowed to... What, why? Who? Why? Or were they were part exactly. of... Oh, no, exactly. prove they were part of the fire service. They were just running, and now we should let everybody out, and it yeah, just creates a political nightmare. Exactly, exactly. So, so we've agreed to 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 leave Hungary and go into that no man's land. Was there any reservation uh, in doing that? I mean, was there any like it, no. it's, it's called no man's land for a reason, right? <laughs> you know, it's not it's not the wild no. west, but it's not a million miles away from it. There's probably things that happen in those areas that uh, it's nobody's legislation, it's nobody's accountability, it's nobody's responsibility, and uh, that's often where. A lot of charitable organisations, a lot of media um, people can get into sticky, sticky positions quite quickly because they're in they're in no man's land. Yes, and 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 we did as well. Although although it's very you know it's 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 only a, basically a tiny little road bridge and then a big car park and yeah. it's it's already under control because of maybe because of the war, but it's it's patrolled by you know Ukrainians with with automatic weapons all the time so it's it's not like it it's it, it, it's a wild west i think we've been desensitized uh, a little bit these days to seeing so many armed individuals i mean since we had the, the attacks in in the uk and stuff like that there's a lot more armed police and and, and i personally support that I, I love to see skilled operators with the ability to make the right decisions hopefully but when you go somewhere like that was was there any surrealness about seeing such a uh, heavy presence of, of of military force, or even just like new military force, where you know males have been empowered with, um, you know, it's assault not, rifles? Effectively, not, not really. You know, because me being uh, having Polish background, you know, I remember before Poland used to be in the European Union that every border looked like that. You know, the, we I think we are now too co- too cocooned. In in the uh, oh maybe now not with the Brexit, but but that borders don't exist. Yeah, you know, we are back, we are back. still pretty cocooned. I know uh, theoretic, not theoretically. Yes, borders now exist um, and are more um, defined, but we still like we, there's still got a real elitist approach to the to the globe. Being in the UK, we think it, we think everybody wants to see us. We can go anywhere we like. There's no limitations on us, Definitely. and that's quite Definitely. an elitist view uh, of the world, really. And and you know when I was a child, the border was the border. You know there was there was scary men with big guns, and and you're not supposed to say jokes, smile, or anything, you, you, because they can mess you up very quickly, and not in in, in physical way, but in a way that you'll need to sit there for maybe another ten hours if you, yeah. if you're being too cheeky. Yeah. So so I'm still I'm I'm I've I've got good memories of those type of borders. You know, so so at least going to those countries. For me, it's quite natural. As take I us down that. Maybe take other- us down that road for a minute, you know, because I know mm-hmm. you, you live in you live in Scotland now. But talk us just give, give us that whistle stop tour of how you found yourself to be to be part of the fire service in Scotland and where you came from, really. Uh, so I came to or oh, back then to to England as <laughs> as a as a naive nineteen year old about seventeen years ago, and it was just a summer holiday. It was supposed to be me and the then girlfriend, now wife, two silly kids uh, to fly over and see how how life is in the different different country, mm. and and it kind of kind of backfired. You know, we we seen it we seen it as a bit of a, as a bit of an adventure. You know, we started uh, living in some in somebody's room. You know, sleeping on the floor for for a couple of months. Yeah, and and thinking, oh, this is this is not too bad. You know, and 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 then it kind of. Uh, at that time, we already had a one-year-old daughter, but she oh, stayed with my, oh, right. okay. so she my, wife, back. my wife's mom. At least for the first three months, she did. Uh, and then when we kind that of, is a uh, surreal uh, no. situation for, for people in the UK. <laughs> all right, all right. I know that I know that family and culture. We had a, a, another friend. I think his episode came out today. Actually, a, a Polish gentleman. 
and he tells me of how community is so much stronger in those places and that your parents you, you live with your parents sometimes and they look after their their family a lot more so it, it's not as strange to leave a young child with a close relative now over here is like your your kids are your kids and they're your your problem and we i think people in the uk will probably never think about doing that yeah no no that that, that was never a problem it, it was more of a you know i now we've got another child uh, you know, 15 years different between children. Uh, and when now we've got another child and we were worried about going to the restaurant. You know, what about if we run out of nap? <laughs> crazy you know? condition now. And, and, you, yeah, got soft. Yeah, nap, you got soft, brother. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, I think we, we've grown up, you know, back then because we were kids, we thought, you know, the world's our oyster, you know, we'll go and do whatever we want. Yeah. Uh, and nobody, nobody's going to stop us. And, and as stupid as it was, do you think it's stupid? Though? Uh, I mean, you say no. I, I still think it, I'm a naive 32 year old. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I still have the optimism. And yeah, there's a lot of nasty, horrible things that happen in the world. But we can, and people will say that our children are more at threat now than they ever have been. And I, think, I appreciate they are maybe from the fact that they interact with the online world so much is perhaps where the biggest threat comes from. But I feel like my kids are pretty safe. You know, I give my daughter a lot of freedom. She walks to and from school and stuff like that. And. Yes, there's always the opportunity, oh, I, but I try and empower her with the right sort of mindset. And the right, and I'm not, I'm not a perfect parent by any stretch of the imagination. But do you do you think kids are as safe these days as they used to? I know we're getting off topic here. We'll get back, but I, th- I think so. And and I, I, maybe because of my upbringing, you know, we were always outside and all that, and we were always kind of independent to the to a certain degree. So I, uh, with my older daughter, who's now going to be 18 next month, we were very happy for her to very early on have her own key to the house, you know, to go walk back and from school on her own. Yeah. And, and and we actually, and, and maybe now I can say it because so many years has passed, we are actually worried that what will the neighbors say if they see that? We were perfectly happy with our child to do it. And we would, we trusted her that she'd be perfectly fine because we know her, but but we were worried, you know, what if the neighbors would see her coming back home on her own, you know, and, and, and we were a bit worried about that. Yeah, uh, but but we had no doubt in our mind that she's totally capable of it. So, but, what you made know, you that, want to stay and be part of the, the the UK, and then eventually work your way into the fire service? Oh, it was a funny thing because it was, as I said, it was a bit of an adventure. You know, it was it was silly, naive adventure because you know we were two young people with no certainly hardly any money. You know, with basic. English and, and, and thought we're going we're gonna to make a living for ourselves. You know, we were two young people, let's say, in love who thought we don't need adults to tell us what to do. We'll, we'll just, you know, provide for ourselves. Mm. And, and that's what we kind of had a go at. And, do you and know what, though? I, to... I, I would rather have that mindset, and I'd, I would rather we still have more people with that mindset. I think now what we've got is only half of it sometimes, which is I don't want adults or I don't care about adults telling me what to do. But then we don't get the last bit, which is I'm gonna I'm just gonna go off and, and earn for myself. I'm gonna go off and make a living for myself. It's like saying I don't want to tell them what to do, but I want them to pay for me. Then I'm like, no, 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 no. You, yeah, can, you can't have half the deal. You got to have the whole deal. <laughs> it's not you can't. It's, it's not pick and mix. You can't pick and choose. So you know, so it was very very quick period of growing up for me. You know, from 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 living with my parents. Never, you know, to this day, I have never been an adult in Poland. You know, I, 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 I've left when I was 19, let's say always still at school, always with my parents, never paid a bill in my life in Poland or, or, or you know, bought a car or, or whatever, driven a car. And and here I was trying to find a job in a country that I've never heard of and, and, and I just barely speak a language. God, uh, but it was exciting, but it was exciting, you know. Uh, and after three months, we felt so that it was going so well that we brought our daughter over. <laughs> wow. And... A one-year-old, and, yeah, and, and just, you, you know, guys are nineteen and, and, and eighteen and twenty or whatever yeah. you were then. Wow. Yeah, and and and, and but and we started little jobs here and there. You know, I was working night shift. Uh, the, the the wife was working during the day, so we were swapping to look yeah. after the child. Passing shifts and, in the morning. And it was <laughs> it was it was ridiculous, but but at the time we thought that's what necessary to 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 make a living. Is and it ridiculous though? I like it. I love it, mate. I'm, 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 you know, I'm romantic. I like that. God, you backs up against the wall. Let's make it happen. Come on. Now, what sort of life? How, oh, yeah. how are you living? How do you want to live? What are you going to do about it? Do you know, we live in a such an affluent society. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to go out there? And you know, man, I cannot even begin to imagine what it must have been like for 
for somebody like yourself and your and your wife, having people wagging their finger in your cell in your face and saying, "Oh, you stupid foreigner," or you don't, he doesn't understand it. He, might, he doesn't understand the language. He doesn't know those words, you know. And then being held back from so many positions just because you don't you don't quite get the dialect, or you don't, you're smart, you, you know, you're smart, skilled, dedicated, probably working twice as hard as everybody else, whilst getting shit thrown in your face if you excuse my language you know what i mean whilst getting people pointing the finger laughing at you and not giving you an opportunity that must have just <sighs> i admire you for that i admire anybody for that i've got a you number know, of friends that have emigrated to this country and that makes me feel like a coward i'm like really i i'm worried about these you know prissy little problems that i've got jesus the, the stuff you've been through and the stuff that people in ukraine are going through now is just it annoys I, me i think i think pete now now these days i'm thinking of it in a similar way you do, you know, it's oh, it's something to admire and all that. But at the time, I I didn't see myself as some kind of victim or some kind of, you know, I voluntarily took that on. You know, if, if somebody's not nice to me, that's fine. You know, Poland at the time, at least, was not exactly a welcoming country to foreigners. Yeah. Uh, so 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 I understood why people might not be very keen on us being here. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't nice, you know. It wasn't. It wasn't pleasant. But but I can I can I can explain it to myself. Mm. Well, you know uh, what? And, and so, I've, I've found this because obviously I spent a lot of time in gyms and stuff like that. And over twenty years, I found that the the women from Poland tend to be incredibly beautiful for some reason, and the dudes <laughs> are just scary. <laughs> There's a lot of scary Polish dudes. <laughs> they they all seem to be jacked. They all seem to be strong, hardworking. But, like you could you could hammer uh, a nail in with their head. Do you know what I mean? These dudes, so you, there's no messing about with these dudes. But you know me, I'm not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not like that, but you have the work ethic of that very same person. Do you know what I mean? They, they've, just, uh, they've just applied it in a physical capacity. But again, we talk about your work in the emergency services. You are that relentless dude. You are the, not workaholic, but you still apply that same level of discipline. I know you'll say that you won't, but you do. I try to. I try to. You know, but I think I think it's all down to upbringing. You know, because we or my generation in Poland, where uh, the upbringing was still during the communism, yeah. and there was hardly anything. Everybody was struggling, and I think that's the kind of that, that grit and determination. Because if you don't have it easy, you have to look after yourself. Yeah, uh, and that's where it stems from. You know, but but then you know, I got I got in one of the factories that I work with in. The, there was a nice South African man and he told me about retained fire brigade or fire service that, that was back in Lincolnshire. And I thought, that sounds brilliant. You know, I never considered being a firefighter, but I thought that sounds all right. And I w- went to my local station uh, to ask about it. They were quite welcoming, let's say, you know, for the lack of a better word. And that's, that's uh, and I became a retained firefighter, you know, a few months later. What was your first experiences uh, of it when you first went to the fire station? When you, so I mean, was it a drill night with a you know the old standard retained drill night, it was. throwing ladders up and doing some pumping, same as all over the UK? Or what? What, what did it look like? It, it it was a drill night. Obviously, initially, you know, I, I had a piercing in my bottom lip, so they mocked that a little bit. <laughs> I bloody hope they did. <laughs> I, uh, I had a long hair as well uh, so that had to go oh, it doesn't have to go but uh, I, I, I felt like it should and, it, and it, it, to be fair with you I expected because uh, my only vision of fire service was what it is like or what it used to be like in Poland I expected it to be a lot more militaristic and a yeah. lot a lot tougher but suddenly there, that everybody was quite nice and, and welcoming. You know, it was a bit of a shock. And then they've done the RTC drill, where they used me as a casualty in the car. That was that was but okay. They, they, you they know, leave at least you strapped to the longboard outside because we, <laughs> not saying that we did or didn't used to do that, but I know it's something that gets done. <laughs> no, I I, I I I heard of instances of that happening, but uh, no, they were they were all very nice. And maybe because I was a foreigner, you know, they were they were a bit worried to go too far you know fast forward I thought this would be a great career you know as a whole time and I've started inquiring if I could be a whole time firefighter because for example in Poland you need to be a Polish citizen to be a firefighter oh do you uh, yeah so I've, I've, I've kind of done done a little bit of research you know back then the internet I could afford was going to the library I definitely went to Hampshire I went to Manchester I went to Derbyshire 
I went to South Yorkshire, uh, a few more, Nottinghamshire, definitely. Uh, so it was it was quite a few. And and to uh, at different times, I got to different stages in different counties. Yeah. So and then eventually, uh, I, I've succeeded in what used to be Lothian Borders. Uh, i.e. Edinburgh and the areas around it. I, <laughs> I maybe shouldn't be saying this, but at the time where, when, I, when, I, when I got in, in Edinburgh, I still had an interview to go in South Yorkshire. Oh, mate, I'm, and, I'm the same, uh, honestly. I've, I, uh, so I got a promotion last week, and I am also awaiting a interview outcome from a different brigade, and I'm still considering both of them. And I, I was, <laughs> mate, and that's not... You know, I'm never. You never want to waste anybody's time, but there is. There's lots of opportunities. You know, there's lots of different things that you can do out there, and you're never trying to waste anybody's time. Very respectful of everybody's time, but you've got to be. You've got to be an individual. You've got to do what's best for you and your family at the end of the day. Yeah, but, but at the same time, you know, I've, I've kind of accepted the Edinburgh offer, but I never got in touch with South Yorkshire. That I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna pursue it. Yeah, and and I totally forgot about it. And then I remember waking up one morning, my phone ringing. And, 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 and some obviously kind gentleman uh, introducing himself and saying he's phoning from South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service and they are awaiting me at the interview. <laughs> and Jesus so, so from, 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 from this place, I should apologize that, for wasting their time. Uh, and I remember I gave some excuse about childcare or something. But uh, Yeah, you, totally let, you let that one it. go too far. You dropped the ball on that one. Yeah, yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have. But at the time, you know, I... I, I, I I, I was kind of caught, caught off guard, uh, uh, and I do apologise. I do apologise for, for whoever was doing it. At your shit. <laughs> they're probably re- they're probably retired now. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so take us yeah. back. And you know, speaking about when you, you're upbringing in Poland, I suppose when you got to when you've been to Moldova and perhaps when you've been to you know now to Ukraine and stuff like that. I wonder if for you, and that's why, you know, at the beginning of our conversation, you didn't disregard it, but it was one of those, yeah, yeah, because that's probably a bit more of a familiar environment for you than than it would be for somebody like me. Definitely, definitely. And especially in Ukraine, Ukrainian language, apart from the alphabet, which is like Russian alphabet, the letters are different, in speaking form is very similar to Polish language. Okay. So I, I, I can, as much as I don't understand much of Russian, I can definitely understand quite a bit of Ukrainian, uh, so that helps. Uh, Moldovan, not so much because they kind of talk Romanian version or, or Romanian language or version of Romanian language. Mm. But at the same time, every firefighter that I've trained there spoke Russian as well. Oh. So again, with my with my very limited Russian skill, I could have at least had had a little bit more chat or not chat maybe but some kind of build, build rapport with people yeah you're able to yes, at least get yes. a bit more of a connection with them you can, even if you just share three or four yeah. words it goes a long way exactly exactly and, and and they then enjoyed working with me a lot more than uh with somebody let's say somebody else who had to use a translator yeah. or interpreter all the time yeah so, so so for me going to those places it's it, it, you know let's let's not say it's like coming back home because the fire service in Poland is these days it's I personally think it's surpassing the UK fire service in many ways. Wow! But the fire services over there are still in those 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 basic structures and they are very militaristic as well. Some part parts like the whole time guys in Moldova are part of military as well. Uh, so, and there's a real uh, superpower it, to that as well. I'm not so like I'm not talking superpowers in a global sense. What I mean is, we we've actually we've got away from a lot of the uh, stuff that worried us about you know being considered to be too militaristic and being a bit too rigid in the way that we do things. But it does give you an incredible um, amount of expected discipline and personal accountability when you're holding people to a higher standard like that. You know, I know we've spoken privately before about this thought process that we feel like we're falling asleep at the wheel and it's, you know, it's part of the whole point of the podcast and some of the people you've introduced us to because trying to slowly turn up the temperature in the room and trying to turn up that the passion and the drive and the personal accountability. Um, just just speak to that if you can about that whole sort of falling asleep at the wheel aspect and how we've got to be really careful that we aren't, um, aren't allowing ourselves to, to lower our standards really. You know, it's very difficult to talk about because over the last few years when I've 
properly became involved or passionate about my my job. You know, before I was I was a firefighter, but I was I was I was going with the flow. Let's say as for last maybe four or five years. I've decided to kind of have a good hard look at myself and and actually be a firefighter. I'd want myself to be, and I'd want to turn up to my house if there's a fire. And I have definitely, you know, noticed it. Look, whether even looking at other fire services, you know, the that are very imp- like the guys in Paris Fire Brigade, for example, are just something else. You know, they they are like from another planet. Yeah, it, it seems like we're not doing the same job. But even within our UK fire service, I'm welcoming the wider approach to recruitment. I think that fire service should be a place where everybody is welcome and everybody can have a go and try their their strengths and weaknesses. Mm. I think everybody should be given the opportunity to try and meet the standard. Definitely. As and that's and I'm I'm being very particular about my words there because I would invite everybody Of course to to challenge themselves to raise up to that required standard what i don't want to do is make our desire for inclusion become a greater desire than our desire to be professionals and to have and encourage excellence in the sector it shouldn't come at the sacrifice of our ability to to do what we're supposed to be doing which is serve the communities in the best possible manner definitely and 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 i think the uh, Somebody, I can't remember, maybe John McDonough, who you spoke with on your podcast before as well, uh, said something that, that, or maybe I'm misquoting him now, but it's that we shouldn't shouldn't allow ourselves to stop actually doing our job or stop what the public or the communities expect us to do. You know, I know that we need to try to eliminate the risk factor of our job, but unfortunately, that's the job we have all chosen. Yes. And, and and the risk factor will be there. We should obviously work as hard as we can to eliminate unnecessary risk. But, but not the to the point, time, yeah, but we should then still expose ourselves to risk in a controlled way, which is what training is. You know, we, yes, yes, when we totally, get to incidents, totally. yeah, try and avoid as much risk as is possible and, whilst and, balancing uh, our ability to be practitioners to be able to safely get and, to work in a highly risk risk environment. Totally. You know, and I think it's something something to do with maybe risk literacy. You know, that if 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 you are if you are an expert at something, the risk is not you understand what risk you are taking yeah. and that you are trained to deal with that risk. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm sure John McDonald says says a little analogy that you know if 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 there is a cliff and there is it's 10 feet apart you know you you can probably just 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 jump it yeah but again if it gets bigger and bigger somebody who's well trained and the, let's say long jumper he'll say that's not a problem for me yeah but absolutely. somebody who's not trained that will be a massive risk for them mm. it's so like when you so see levels that, of gymnastics or anything like that with somebody that's got that level of discipline core strength flexibility because they've worked on it for years and years and years that is not a dangerous thing for them to attempt. Even the simplicity no. of I was fitness is a lovely simple enough. You know, if I'm going to do a squat or whatever, if it gets too heavy, I know how to get out of it safely and not hurt myself. Yeah. I know how to dump the bar safely and get out of there. If somebody doesn't know how to do that, they're going to get stuck under it. They're going to get crushed. They're going to hurt their spine. They're going to damage their knees. Not because it was too risky for them to be there, because they weren't trained, they weren't familiar with the risks, they didn't know how to get out safely and quickly. Those 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 analogies are things that, like you say, there's 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 the calculation there about if you increase the skill set and if you increase the competency of somebody, you you inherently reduce the risk because they're more skilled and competent to deal with the risk. They do it on a and also we talk about frequency, ex, so a constant exposure if you can do so that it's constant micro exposure to those risks so that you build up a tolerance to it as well not a dangerous tolerance but like he said you know if there's a if there's a compartment fire or if there's a structure fire i'm going to send people in i don't care if there's anybody in there or if they're not in there as long as the building doesn't look like it's about to collapse i want them to run the drill i want them to go through the methods i want them to get in there i want them to do you know control fire 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 behavior compartment behavior I want them to run that drill. I want them to see it. I want them to see how it reacts to their maneuvers and their behaviors and the way that they use use cooling and stuff like that. They should run that. Yeah. So because because then when 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 it actually happens that there is somebody in there, they're not doing it for the first time. Absolutely. They know exactly what to expect. 
uh, and and that's something. What, what, what another thing I will mention, Pete, that I, I feel quite quite strong or quite passionately about is that the training we do, including especially foundation training, we have widened our our search for people. You know, back uh, 20, 30 years ago, you know, people in the fire service were mostly ex maybe army or or tradespeople. Yeah. Uh, you know, now now we've widened that net, and and quite rightly so. But unfortunately, I feel like our way of training has not adapted to that. You know, we still train as per 1970s training manuals, but we've got people coming into the job that have, for example, never held a hammer in their, in their hand in their life. Absolutely correct, mate. Absolutely correct. We're building on, we a, on, a, on an assumed to. foundation. Like you say, we're assuming that character building and that conditioning from, from their environment has already happened. You know, when you and I were kids, you know, we were you know messing about with that car, or we were trying to change spark plugs, yeah. or we were doing all of this stuff. We were getting out there and, you know, getting a pen knife and setting fire to stuff in the woods, and then learning how to put it out, and then you know, <laughs> trying to build a rope swing, and all of this that you know we're doing Cub Scouts and all that sort of stuff. All of that conditioning, we can't assume that now. The foundation is not no, the same as it was, not. and we have got to step up. And we've had this conversation before when we've, because we're not moaning now, but we, we've had conversations privately where we've been like, "Oh man, this and that and that," and, I'm, and we've been calling each other out on that BS, which is, well, we are part of the solution. <laughs> we have got to be the solution. You don't get to pick your problems. It doesn't matter whose fault it is, yes, whose responsibility is it to fix it. It's our responsibility. We are here right now. If it was crap ten years ago, somebody else's fault. If it's not good now, it's your fault. It's my fault. Yeah, we have got yeah. to build the foundation again. We can't just assume because, like you say, we're not getting those 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 people delivered into the services anymore, and that comes with its benefits. But, like you say, we've got to adapt for it. Because I, I I am a great believer in the view that we need to recruit people for their attitude, not necessarily their abilities. You know, if somebody's passionate about the job, we can teach them everything that the job entails. That's all that should be required. If they've got the right mindset for this job and the right mindset for learning and self-development, they will learn all the practical yeah. skills. If you've got the mindset, uh, I can teach you the skill set. That's what that's what it's all about. I see definitely. so many people now, and I and it sounds horrible, but I really they grind me because they've got the skill set, but they haven't got the mindset anymore. They're not interested. Definitely, and 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 I, and I think unfortunately, get rid of them. That was the case for for many many years that you, you fitted that uh, uh, kind of prescribed uh, something what we're looking for and you fit it, then, then yeah, come in. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you actually think about the job or, or how you're going to carry yourself through yeah. the you know, 30 years of career. Uh, but you know that's that's a long conversation. <laughs> take uh, I, I love the I love going down rabbit holes with you, brother. Take us back. <laughs> take us back to to, to Ukraine. So you, you've go got back. there. You've 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 managed to get across the border. If I remember, yeah, remember correctly, and then yes, you managed to yes. you managed to deliver the vehicles. Everything's getting unpacked. Everything's uh, getting unbundled. Um, what was the what was the yes. reception like when you got there? Oh, and I'll tell you what the little little story that happened when we were we are unpacking. The the Ukrainian uh, fire service guys came up, met us, all brilliant. You know they helped because obviously the the four fire engines they were taking them, but the lorry had to be repacked into their lorry because the lorry was coming back with us. Oh yeah. Uh, so so that was you know a very very quick operation of. You know, every, uh, all hands on deck. Just and a chain just, gang, just, yeah, just go. Just get yeah, basically, done. basically. And there I'm getting the phone call from the our uh, Hungarian fixer. And he says, oh, so how is it going? Where are you, where, where, where are you guys? And I'm saying, oh, we're in this this no man's land bit here, you know, on, between the borders, just unpacking stuff. And he's like, you where? And I'm like, oh, what's, 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 what's wrong? You know, we're... And he says, why did you go in there? And like, oh, we didn't know that we were supposed to. You know, if that is the only way for us to, to give the equipment, yeah. then, then, then that's what we have to do. You know, we not came all this way to then not do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and what transpired, is, and, and, and to be fair, I should have maybe noticed something, but it never struck me. When we turned up to the border, I was expecting to see thousands of refugees. And there weren't any. There were buses with like women and children going through, and they were stopping there 
and all that, but but not like queues of people. And I thought, hmm, that's that's a bit strange. But you know, like I thought, maybe 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 it quieted down because it was Sunday. I thought maybe they don't don't come through on Sundays. <laughs> it's day off, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're desperate, they're not that desperate. But anyway, no, we... yeah, 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 yeah. Obviously, we're we're joking here, but uh, but what transpired was that this border crossing does not serve pedestrians. And the problem now we had is that the trucks are getting left, being left in Ukraine and we need to walk back into Hungary. And this suddenly is a problem. Yeah. Because we can't. So, so then, you know, it was, it was, it was a tragedy. The, 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 our fixer boy was losing his head. Uh, what have we done and all that? He says that the next pedestrian crossing, border crossing, is about 30 kilometers away and uh, because the refugees are there, there is about three day wait to go back into Hungary. Jesus! But like, uh, surely they could see you. Surely, like the border, you're like, like you say, you've not gone too far. They're like, oh, hey guys, you know, you knew, you saw us six hours ago. You know, it's like it's like when you go out the wrong door of a of a restaurant or a club, and you're like, dude, I'm just gonna pop to my car. Uh, this is me. I'm going to be back in like five minutes. You let me back through. And he goes, yeah, sure. No problem. Sure. You know, I mean, I know I'm trying to make it yeah, simplistic. Yeah, yeah. Is that not how it works? <laughs> Once you're through, you're through, uh, you're not coming back. It kind of is and it isn't. Apparently the borders now are very, very secure because of the, you know, there is a lot of smuggling going on as a background to the war. Uh, so, so they're trying to be extra vigilant. Yeah. Uh, also, and to because be fair, of the, if there's the, six big vehicles going through like that, it's a fantastic opportunity for somebody to smuggle something. Definitely, through. it'd be a very definitely. cheap way to do it. You know, we talk about Trojan horses and stuff like that. That's exactly what you're looking at there. And 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 and, and people, yes, exactly. And people uh, were telling me, oh, why did they not just wave you through? It's, it's after all, it's it's stuff for them to help them. And but it's, yeah, but it's not that easy. You know, it's not that no, simple. People don't know that. Uh, you know, if you say no, I've got a big empty tank in the middle of my fire engine there'll be a lot of people that might want to benefit from that big empty tank in the middle of your fire engine. Definitely, definitely. And then another another thing is that because of this uh, ban of, for males leaving Ukraine, uh, there is very scrupulous checks on the borders to check if the people that are leaving Ukraine or entering Hungary for that matter are not doing it on false papers. They are not Ukrainians with false papers trying to leave the country. Isn't that so, a strange thing as well? It's not strange, but like I try and liken it to things that happen in the UK and I've had these conversations with a few people where I'm like, you know, if this happened over here, you know, I feel like we've got lost in the woods so much that if there was a big call to arms in the UK, how many people would 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 pick up a rifle? How many people or not even pick up a rifle? How many would people would, you know, make sandbags? Or how many people would, you know, go and craft yeah. or harvest food out of the fields or, you know, make uniforms or whatever? I think I don't I don't know I, I hope I'm wrong but I worry that there would be a lot of people going I ah, it's not my problem I'm like, what are you on about you know mm. I, I think a lot of people in the emergency yeah. services we we kind of do it anyway you know we, we don't get paid a lot of money by comparison of working in the private sector so we would all opt in anyway but if they said nobody can leave if you're between these ages man We'd have a domestic yeah, war. But- never, never, you know, let alone <laughs> other people, other people trying to cause us some problems. It's, it's amazing that uh, I'm, I'm in awe of the people that are doing it. But I, must be I do think that sometimes. I do think that sometimes to myself and I, and I, I share your opinion. Although I know that people under crisis, maybe they would kind of you know yeah. uh, get together a little bit. If somebody but, backed you up at all, wall, the, you'd be surprised what you'd do. The the, the difference is that. In this country, obviously, people were not subjected to any kind of, and I, and I don't mean it lightly, hardship. You yeah. know, the, uh, Ukraine only became a country in, I don't know, 91 or 96, was it? Yeah. Uh, an independent state. Uh, obviously, Ukrainian, you, historically, yeah. Ukraine has been a country for, for hundreds of years. but well, very, war, very much like what uh, happened in Kosovo, though. You know, Kosovo is probably a more, a more, a more recent example. 10 or of, 10 of 15 years ago, wasn't it, that they... Maybe slightly longer. Sorry. Definitely. Then they became Definitely. a lot uh, of people still don't recognise them, and they have had to yeah. grind that. It was not given to them. That has come from blood, sacrifice, walking hundreds of miles. You know, no food. You know, terror. You know, terrible acts that have happened to their children and their women and stuff like that. They have earned it. So, so, and I think that the population 
still remembers those hard days. You know, the, the people living there, every, everybody who's over 30, you know, have lived during communism yeah. and, and, and the troubles. People still got probably guns squirreled away uh, in their houses, you yeah. know. So it's, it's, it's maybe a little bit different. Uh, than our situation here, I think we've been we, we are we, we've been comfortable for for maybe too long yeah. for or any about two or of three the current generations generation. later. Yeah, maybe two yeah. Gen- two yeah. generations later than people who had to face true adversity, and it gets it gets filtered and dissipated as it goes through each generation. So now we're so very detached from from what that really is like. Definitely surreal. Uh, so, so how did you get back? <laughs> yeah, how did you get back? Uh, you're not well, still I, there I, now, I, right? I, I, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not speaking to you in Ukraine, brother. <laughs> no, we got we got back. You're speaking to me of, from a cave uh, in the back of somebody's house, hiding yeah, under the floorboards yeah, yeah. or something. Uh, no, I'm, I'm I'm safely back in Scotland, but it, it's it's it, 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 it there was a lot of discussion and a lot of you know because it, it's it's a typical thing on the border. You know, the one side tells you, "No, it's fine. Just do this. Do it this way. Uh, you'll be totally fine." And then you get to the other guys, you know, and they tell you, "What? That's never going to happen," you know. And, and it's, <laughs> it's kind of that. Uh, it's, but in the, yeah, I'm 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 not going to tell you how we no, got no, back no, in no, 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 because no. it wasn't it was, but it, it 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 was challenging. And all the the credit to the brilliant fixer Patrick we had in Hungary because he's he's made a lot of phone calls to top brass in Hungarian border guards and all that to get us out. So. So all the credit to him. So what's it like being back? You know, you had to transition straight into to normal life. You've been exposed to, you know, the reality of some of the stuff that's going on in the world. And you've come back to somebody moaning that they can't get leave on Saturday night or the Wi-Fi is not working <laughs> or, you know, someone uh, someone's refusing to uh, make lunch for the watch. It's it's surreal, Pete. It's surreal. It's 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 not even that because I've, I've had those feelings, the, the way you described them, after previous trips, because, you know, although the, previously there was never a war, but it was still, let's say, a destitution or, or, or quite a poor countries. Yeah. But this time, I actually, when, when, you, when we drive there, it obviously takes a few days of drive. In this case, it was whatever, four days uh, of nonstop driving. So you kind of feel like you're getting far away from home. But then way back, it's 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 just a flight over, and you know within two three hours you're back. And when the, my wife picked me up from the airport, I actually felt quite quite emotional. Not not in a way that I, I, I can't describe it. it. It was just I felt definitely part of it was like guilty that now I'm sitting in my nice comfortable car, you know, going. Yeah. Whatever I want, I can I can stop at any point, buy anything I want, and these people are left there, who I have just spoken with, you know, a few hours ago, are still left in that horrible, horrible situation from which we, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't know what to do. It's, it's so surreal as well, because it's not like oh, it's, you've it's, you've I say no, you do anything special. You've not done anything special to get back. You've just utilize transport that should be available to everybody yes you've literally and, and the just privileges. Few, the privileges yeah the unknown privileges where you just you oh, suddenly arrive my, back and your missus is like missed you lots what you know i'll make your specialty what, what do you want you know let's let's go and see the kids and you're like i've just oh, that's, that never happened <laughs> okay <laughs> okay let's, let's just pretend. <laughs> she's like i've left the washing for you you've been gone for days yeah the stuff that needs fixing yeah, the house, yeah, right? yeah. you've had your holiday <laughs> It was like that. It was, but anyway, uh, it's 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 the privilege that we don't think of of let's say having a Western passport. You know, now me having a British passport and Polish passport, which then gives me access to EU as well. At least I'm not I'm not subject to Brexit. I don't think we appreciate that. You know, mm. that passport lets me leave the country that is at war, and other people are not allowed to do that. Just purely because the accident of birth came to this world a d- different bit of land, you know. That is where I think it's imagine- such, I love that. I love you saying that. Sorry to interrupt. It's just such, like you say, people didn't earn a lot of this stuff. You were just born in the right place. Or the right, not the yeah, right somebody- place, but you were just, it was just a lottery. All right, don't, 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 don't talk to me about, you know, privilege and you've earned this. and yeah. you, you, you should make the most of where you are. 
and I believe we should all be patriotic Definitely. and we should support our communities, you know, and I'm sure that's probably obvious to people in what we do. But you are here by by chance. You won, You did win the lottery. You may feel like life sucks, and I'm, I apologise for anybody that's going through challenges that feel like they're outside of their control, but you are very lucky if you're listening. If you're listening to this, you probably live in the Western world and you've probably, you've probably got a lot of privileges you don't realise. Definitely. And, 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 and it's maybe in Britain is a bit different because we are an island. But yeah. in, on mainland Europe, it's just a matter of that imaginary line in the sand between one country and the other. You know, and, and these lines have changed over the years hundreds of times. Yeah. Uh, uh, and suddenly people on one side of that line who were maybe neighbors are, are, are totally against each other or, 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 or one of them have quite a lot of privileges and the others are living in destitution. It's, it, it just boggles my mind. Do you, do you ever experience anything like that still? Uh, you know, because there are still pockets of uh, unknown or, sorry, subconscious sort of prejudices and, you know, bigotry and all this sort of silliness that we still have, even in, even within the UK, people that are just ignorant and, and educated. You still have a noticeable accent, as I'm sure people will have noted. Yes. Do you, do you ever have that? Do you ever, I mean, you, you said, I'd totally forgotten, to be fair, I know we've had lots of conversations before, but when you said, you know, I came over when I was 19, I'd completely forgotten that you'd come from somewhere else. To be honest, you know, I, I know as you, I know you as Mike from Scotland. I don't, I don't think of you as Mike from Poland. You know, it's weird, but you must still get that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you? yeah. I know you. One, I know one of your children was obviously born in the UK, and you, you, but your partner came over with you as well. Yes, I'll, I'll tell, I'll tell you one story that that is with me till till this day, and it wasn't even too nasty at the time. I never felt, but like, it's a fire brigade story. Uh, uh, and I'm not obviously for that reason I'm not going to name any names but I remember soon after I joined the fire service in Edinburgh one of the first fires we had with a station because my, my station is a multi-pump station we've got two pumps ladder and a special and so so we deal with majority of our fires by ourselves but on this occasion it was one of the maybe slightly bigger fires and we went over to the neighboring station area and I remember being there the other station pump was sitting there and I didn't know what to do you know I was I was it was quite fresh after my foundation course so I just stood next to the guy from my pump and was waiting for basically him to maybe tell me to do something because I was lost and there comes a guy from that neighboring station to us and the guy from my station says to his um, to him oh look this is our new probie and you know I'm, I'm already sweating you know thinking oh what he's gonna say and he looked me up and down and says is he gay <laughs> and you know because that that was i joined the fire brigade the time where there was a lot of positive action days you know and, and all that so the, the the old hand they always thought that anybody joining the fire brigade these days is gay so fucking uh, well, who gives a shit but yeah obviously 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 but but that wasn't the worst of excuse it, my know? language so, sorry so he's he, he kind of looked me up and down and says and says to the not even to me but to the other guy from my station says Oh, is he gay? And the boy from my station replies to him, no, it's worse. He's Polish. At the time, you know, I thought, oh, at least, at least you know, at least they're not being fucking, you know, aggressive to me or whatever. But now looking back at it, I I, I, I feel like, like a piece of shit, you know? Yeah. And and probably I'll, 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 I'll never forget that. Uh, but but that's what the, what the reality is of it was you know and 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 i'm sure a lot has changed in that time yeah but unfortunately experiences like that are are, are with you to stay and unfortunately i feel, that, I feel that, triggered that, sometimes when i see I, I still see it with uh we're lucky enough to have a lot of ladies that have joined uh, my particular fire station it makes for a great environment for various reasons but um it is <laughs> behave yourself <laughs> but no, yeah, you know, you know what? They're they're up. They're so gregarious, so interested. Course, these are, these are opportunities that they've never had before, and everything is so new to them because um, they've been conditioned not to. You know, they maybe haven't got you know tools out working on their cars when they were kids and stuff like that. So we we're able to get into so many of the basics, and they find it so interesting. And I find it interesting because I'm interested in anybody that finds it interesting. But I always feel so triggered, and and I I think I if I'm really giving myself a bit of self awareness, I probably get over triggered because I was bullied as a kid, <laughs> really bullied as a kid, and that kind of what led me to to doing loads of weightlifting and muscle building and all that craziness and that minefield that went down. Um, 
so when I see anything like that, it's almost like I have an allergy to it. You know, it's like a peanut allergy. Yeah. And when I feel it, I'm triggered. And I'm sure I probably snap some people's heads off sometimes. But I suppose I, we all justify our own behaviors for various reasons. And I, and I feel like for any time that I may accidentally offend somebody who I believe is, is harassing or bullying somebody else, that's, I feel justified of the slight bit of discomfort they might feel Mm -hmm. because of the potential unheard silenced, you know, harassment and discomfort and eventually leaving the service that will have happened so many times before. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not the bloody savior of the fire service of God's sake. It'll be a long time after, but I I get so triggered when I hear that. And, uh, and I'm I'm always on the front foot with it, but I appreciate it. does It does cause a barrier sometimes. But you know, on 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 balance, you know, since I came to Scotland, it, it, it's been so. People have been so so nice. You know, I think Poland is Scotland have a lot of ties with Poland. You know, in Second World War, there was a lot of uh, tr- Polish troops stationed here. Uh, so a lot of, especially older people, still have a lot of good memories of of Polish troops and Poland in general. So. Uh, it, Honestly, since since I, I I have arrived here in Scotland, I can only say good things about it, you know. And then yes, there there, there maybe were singular incidents, but that's not representative of how people are here at all. No, I love having having anybody that's come from a different country or from an underrepresented group because usually, and I don't even really care, care what, if, what country they've come from or what you know thing they're part of. But again, we talk about that mindset, skill set. They've usually got a bit of a fuck you mindset where they're like i'm gonna do this i'm gonna learn this because i know you don't want yeah. me to learn it and you're waiting for me to get this wrong so you can point the finger and go ha ah, see i told you didn't know how to do it so that gives them that i'm gonna do this and i'm i'm, I'm used to people shaking their finger in my face so that's not going to deter me because they've already gone through so many barriers to be standing in the start line do you know what I mean? Some people are born on the start line. Yeah. They're not born on the start line. They have had to travel and get through and learn the language and learn the skill set, learn how to live in this in this country. They have got a much deeper grit than so many other people. So I would rather have them because when stuff does get difficult, which inevitably is going to at some point in time, of course. they will be there. They are not going to turn tail and run. They're going to lean in. They're going to step forward. They're going to say, what else do you need me to do? What can I do? What do you need me to? What do you need me to do next? Have we thought about this? Have we thought about that? You know what? I've got that covered. That's the person I want. You know, That's what, the person I want next to me. What What I enjoy about it as well is that different upbringing of different people from different cultures gives us different perspective on certain problems and issues, and then these people, because of their outlook on life, can have contribution towards the problems we are having right now. Absolutely. It, completely different that I could never, uh, you know, foresee or, or think of. So, so I definitely appreciate somebody who had totally different upbringing and totally different culture to come and contribute because I cannot, you know, I don't know everything and uh, there's plenty I don't know. And so, so, so have an extra pair of eyes and especially somebody, another pair of eyes looking from not the same angle as I am looking yeah it, it, it's great it's great yeah what i do want to, uh, to ask you about as well and and you know we, before we sort of wrap it up because you are the sort of person that has already gone out and you know you said you, there's lots of things you don't know what i do know about you is you're the sort of person that's going out and finding these resources so give people the the benefit of just some of the many conversations we've had about you know, people that are coming into the services, what are the things they should be looking for? What are the great resources that may or may not have been available to them in their services, but places where you have personally got a lot of value from? I know you've, you you know the right websites, you know the right seminars. Just give us off the top of your head a few places. Because again, when you compare us to, you know, to, to Paris-based prison firefighters and some of the Polish fire services, they are continuing down that road of personal development that at sometimes we've taken the foot off the gas a little bit. So where are some places, because I know we're trying to share as many of them as we can on the podcast, but I'll be honest with people, you're, you're, you're where a lot of these come from. So uh, give them the privilege from your own words. I'd say, you know, I, I, I got into it by starting reading. You know, there, actually there is a, there is a brilliant uh, instructor, uh, Polish instructor, his uh, name is Szymon Kokot. And, and he got me kind of involved. He showed me 
that it's possible to know more than what the service is teaching you. That, that, that obviously, all the stuff that you're being taught at your service is brilliant stuff, but that's not all of it. That's, that's, that's probably a tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to it, to our craft, because just look at the even different countries fighting fires differently. It's, it's, everybody fights fires and they all go out. So it's not like we're doing something wrong and they're doing something right. Getting all that knowledge from different places and using it to your benefit or to benefit of your organization. You know, the, the, the silly example is putting BA face mask on top of the flash hood and not underneath it. You know, it's, it's in the UK, we, we, it would blow our mind if somebody had done that. And we, we'd call them probably an idiot or, or, or that they're not educated properly. But then firefighters in Scandinavia or, or, or Dutch firefight Belgians, you know, will do it all the time yeah. without, you know, having a second thought. So, you know, they're not stupid. They're not, they're not going out there to kill themselves. <laughs> it, it, clear, it, it clearly works. So, so, so there, is no, there is no need to, to you know, uh, get on your high horse and, 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 and criticize something before you learn why that is taking place. And that's what I've learned for, for years, that, you know, the discussions on social media or whatever, I try to stay out of it because I don't think I'm educated enough. And instead of wasting time on that, I will go and educate myself. Uh, so, and, and, and I think the first book I got my hands on was Paul Grimwood's Euro Firefighter. And, and it just blew my mind that this stuff is from the guy who, you know, some people will call him the godfather of UK fire service. He's on our hit list. And he's he, coming. He's coming. Yeah, he's coming. <laughs> he, he, he is. He is. I'll make sure he is. I know. Uh, uh, he presents all the research, the data, the experience, the vast experience he had on both sides of the Atlantic in such a way, easy for the, let's say, ordinary firefighter to understand. And then you start thinking to yourself, why, why don't we do that? Uh, and, and obviously there is a array of reasons, uh, but and then and then it snowballed from there. You, you start uh, uh, learning about people like John McDonnell uh, and John Chubb in Dublin Fire Brigade. He's he's another great great man. He's great. And, I love them. And and through those people, I have heard of the IFIW, the International Fire Instructors Workshop. I've I started. Googling it, started watching YouTube videos from lectures from previous editions. Then I took part in last year's editions and uh, 2019, 2000, and 2020. And, and I can't wait for another one. I've, I've got a fire behavior workshop to go to in the beginning of June. There is that uh, high rise conference in May in London. Is that still that on I'm, in London? Because I know you sent me a link to I'm, that. Is that, I'm not sure if that's still yes, happening. Is that on? Y- yes. Yes, 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 yes. Definitely have. All right, definitely. I'm going to try and get on that. I'm still, I'm still not sure if, if, if uh, I'll be able to, to, to get there. But I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to, to try. And then there are plenty of online content. I don't, I don't know if you or you will be aware of the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. Yeah. And uh, if you just look up online UL FSRI, there is plenty of content like e-learning lessons based on real life size experiment and they are just invaluable the amount of details and data gathered from these experiments is just mind blowing and the the the, the experts uh, there there's always a panel of experts chosen from around the world to to oversee each each experiment again and then they provide like a quick bite sized chunks of science for you to use uh, at your at your leisure, you know, at your yeah. at your department or at your fire service, and, and a lot of the time sure. as well, a lot of the actionables and a lot of the results that come out of those things will will not always, but will inevitably shape the operational guidance that you will probably end up seeing in about five years' time anyway. But those studies are happening now. You know, and then they need to go through the iterative learning process and the feedback process, and how does it inter, you know, how does it dovetail with our current procedures, and what are we going to adapt, and what equipment requirements is it going to be? But you can stay ahead of the curve, and like you just said, you know, at least demonstrate an awareness and an interest, just an interest in what is happening 
now because then you, you, you can stay ahead of it. And then when, when these things appear to come as like a side swipe curveball and they're like, why are we changing that? Where's that come from? Well, dude, that, that study was like four years ago. Yeah, now it's just it's, now it's just it's, finding its way into the service. But this is this is not new. It's so much easier for me to present it to my watch to 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 my colleagues uh, that something is changing or something. Uh, let's oh let's pick an example of smoke curtains. You know, uh, uh, the first time it was presented to 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 my station, it was like oh what's this? You know, it's a bit of, bit of bit of fire blanket hanging in the door. You know that. It's, oh, how much does 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 this cost? You know, and all this stuff. Mm. Uh, and and then I'm I can I can say you know I I have seen it at work. You know, uh, it's brilliant stuff. Uh, and and you know probably three quarters of European countries are using them. Yeah. And and now they they make in their their impact in America as well. And and because and then because of the of the people I have met because uh, uh, of the, the the events I have attended, when we got the smoke curtains. I have uh, been in touch with Dr. Michael Reich, who was the inventor of the smoke curtain. And he provided me with plenty of pictures of case studies where the smoke curtain was used in real fires of presentations. And then I can sell it to my, to my crew in, in a much broader and quality way. Yeah, uh, rather the, the than the sell is so much it. better than the tell. If it's just a tell, it's like the service says we're using these now. Oh, really? Well, they, they don't want my opinion. I've been a firefighter for thirty years. Well, yeah, they do want your opinion, but you you had the opportunity to give your opinion when the studies were going on. If you really were interested in being a consummate professional firefighter, then you would have been part of it anyway. You know, you would have been that. I always think of you, might like the the wandering student. Do you know what I mean? You've got to go. You've got to be willing to venture out and see what gems you can pick up. You might have to troll through so much stuff. You might have to go through documents and documents and <laughs> YouTube videos and this and that. But then you'll find a nugget and you come back from the wilderness with your nugget and you share your nugget with the team and you go, here's the nugget I found. And they go, that's really interesting. And like you say, when you've got that breadth of holistic knowledge, you're able to sell it rather than just say, I've got this piece of kit now, use it every time you go to a BA job or a high-rise job or you know whatever. And people are like, it looks rubbish. How much was it? A waste of money all the time here. No, we're not. Go and look yeah. at the study. <laughs> and, and, and it's it's quite funny, you know, because we've got in the UK, we've got our set ways of doing things, you know, and 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 they have been there, you know, like our BA boards, our BA shuffles. They they were there because of incidents, probably in the sixties or 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 even earlier. Yeah. Uh, and 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 we are so conditioned to it because we were brought up with it, that we don't imagine not having it or doing something slightly different. Yeah. Uh, and, but I remember when I was training guys in Moldova and, 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 and because obviously when we train guys abroad, we train them to British standards. And I was telling them about how to move around in smoky, smoky room, you know, uh, about BA shuffle and all that. And they asked me, so, so are you telling us that it's hot up in the room and cool down here. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the theory. And he says, so why do you tell us to stand up and search? And why can't we just search down low? And I was like, uh, you know, that's, that's a good point. Because <laughs> that's the way it's always been. Yes, oh, yeah, shit, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, sorry. <laughs> and, 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 the, and, and then you see all the other nations and especially Americans. There's plenty you know, of American uh, firefighters. You see them shuffling through on their back knee. You know, they'll proceed one, yes, one hand yes, on the floor, shuffle yes. through, and people are like, they still do it bloody quick. Yeah, and they can move quicker because they're not constantly exposed to that heat stress as well. But somebody in, 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 in the UK will tell me, oh, because because there could be needles on the floor, you know? And, and I'm like, but, but in how many cases how there many were cases? needles on the floor? Yeah. How, how many times did that happen? You know, and, but in, anyway, you know, it, we're, we're digressing. But I'd like to discuss things with people who are interested in things. You know, uh, I don't like the cocky expressions that you see on social media oh, Americans got nothing to offer to us because they, all they do is go up on the roofs and they cut holes and fall through them, you know, and stuff like that. It, it's just so ignorant yeah. that you you don't want to uh, sacrifice five minutes of your time to learn why do they do that. That's that's part of their, of their strategy. And in certain circumstances, it's a very good strategy. Absolutely. Uh, it, 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 it's not risk-free. But again, in, in the U.S., 
there are, I think, like 30,000 different fire departments from top, top professionals like New York or Boston to very small rural departments. So we can't just say American firefighters are this or that. And, and even and, across and that and range, it, there'll be many differences in the structural integrity of different buildings. There'll be lots of changes of in the materials that are used in those structures. So there is going to be a variation of tactics, of strategies. There's going to be so many different. Doesn't mean they're making it up as they go along. You know, they're, they're not. They're definitely, not, they're not stupid. Definitely. And another problem in America is that these departments are sometimes limited to just a, a little town or something. You know, and so sometimes when I do a case study. I'll, I'll show a picture and, and people will see that there are guys in three different types of PPE, you know, the fire kit. And I'm saying, look, look at this. You know, these are the guys from three different departments. So now they need to kind of work together in what they call mutual aid. And, and they all got different, uh, different procedures and SOPs. And so uh, obviously there is, there is potential for things to go wrong. And we are in Scotland. I think are fortunate enough that now we've became one service quite a number of years ago now, and we all work theoretically at least in the same way. Uh, there are still differences between the regions, but but I think they should be they should be there uh, because not the, the, all all the regions are the same. People in in, in you know firefighters in Edinburgh are not going to fight fires the same way as. Uh, firefighters, you know, in, in Venice, maybe, or, yeah. or or on the on Scottish islands up north. So we shouldn't kind of throw a, a baby with the bathwater uh, and try to make everything exactly the same. But definitely have the basics that then we can branch off and adjust them to our local risks. Well, look, man, you've you've always got a ready set of ears right here, and I know and I'll just put it out there publicly, I, I very much appreciate your support and your involvement from a personal perspective um, in helping me expand my horizon because even I operate in my own biases and my own unknown unknowns where there's so many incredible things out there that it's great to have multiple sets of eyes um, on the horizon seeing what pops up and, and what we can benefit from. So it's been incredible to have this opportunity to speak to you about the great work that Sarah's doing, the great work that you know, you've know you been doing in Ukraine and I know you're going to continue doing it, but what I sincerely hope more than anything is that you continue to be that, you know, wandering, traveling student. And uh, no doubt people will continue to benefit from the things you have managed to, uh, the nuggets you managed to bring back to us. Oh, Pete, uh, thanks for, for, for your kind words, but uh, I, I'm only doing it because I think I want to be good at my job. You know, that's, you know, I'm not doing to impress anybody or to, to get promotion or, but yeah, but you don't hoard time, it either. You don't hoard the knowledge, which is a really but, dis distinct difference between some people that wander for it and some people that benefit from it because they want to share it with other people as well. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I think I have benefited immensely from the podcast that you're doing, you know, and, and I was looking for, for, for something like that for, for years now, somewhere where, where UK firefighters especially can come together and share their knowledge, share their ideas. Because as, as we know, uh, official fire brigades or different brigade documents and maybe even case studies are not exactly what we're looking for, although yeah. as beneficial as they are. Yeah. But we are trying to talk to each other because you know yourself, meeting people from different brigades, it's so, so beneficial. Oh, gotcha. uh, he hearing how they deal with things, what kind of equipment they would use in that situation. It's just, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. And, and I love that. I love, I love talking with people from slightly different areas, backgrounds, cultures than me, because suddenly they will uh, come up with something that for them is totally obvious. And for me, it will be like, like that, you know, light bulb moment above yeah. my head. Yeah. Oh, and that's my great. sincere desire, mate, for, for every single episode that we do. And I think you've you've struck probably more than most. You've probably ignited several light bulbs in me personally. I know I've got about three quarters of a page of names and notes of people you've mentioned <laughs> to me before. And this is like, there's a strange guilt that comes with speaking with you because like you're, you, you give me some wonderful feedback. And you're like, dude, it was really interesting. Just listen to that episode. Great, great, great. Have you considered speaking so-and-so? And I'm like, oh, shit, no, sorry, Mike, I haven't. Damn. And then I add them to the list and I'm like, oh God, I'm not getting through the list. God, I want to speak to that person. Yeah. God, I want to speak to that person. And and look, I encourage people whenever they, they listen to different bits of the podcast, if they think, if they have found a nugget on their own travels, ping it over, bring it in, you know, we can, we can unfold it, we can unwrap it. And who knows, 
for some people they might go I already knew that or for some people it will be that light bulb moment so thank you for providing us with Definitely. another series of light bulbs mate uh, I love that send no, my love to, uh, to the good lady not and the kids all. and everything like that I would love for us to be able to, to get together in London in May if we can both make it down there but if we don't I'll try my know, best. I know our paths will cross again very soon in the future certainly you, you can bet on it see you soon alright Pete you look after yourself The Firefighters Podcast is a global podcast seeking to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operators. Please support your emergency services wherever you are in the world, and thank you for listening.